indrukwekkend, vind ik. Hopelijk jullie ook. Uh, Zurich, 9 februari van dit jaar. Ik klim de trap op in de Vrouwenkliniek Strasse 26. Ik ga naar de tweede etage en daar ga ik op bezoek bij een man die zit in een kamer. Die kamer is niet groot, die is bescheiden zelfs. Maar de man is dat zeker niet. Het is Peter Broeker, hij is neuropsycholoog van het Universiteitshospitaal in Zurich. Hij, zegt of ik, uh, hij vraagt of ik koffie wil. Ik zeg ja, graag. Dan gaat ik op je koffie maken of halen, dat weet ik niet. Ondertussen loop ik er even rond en zie aan de deur een papier geplakt. En daar staat op... The eye-to-eye, arm-to-arm en hand-to-hand meetings will be far more important than digital registrations of those meetings. Peter van Lindonk. Dat had ik kennelijk gezegd, ik wist van niks, dus hij komt terug. Ik zeg... Waar heb je dat vandaan te zitten? Ja, internet natuurlijk. En hij vond een oud interview, wat ik ooit met Monique van Düsseldorf, van Ted, die zit hier ook, heb gegeven. En daar heb ik dat kennelijk in gezegd. Uh, en dat vond hij weer terug. En toen was ik eigenlijk wel trots dat ik dat toen gezegd had. Uh, goed, we spraken over zijn talk. Uh, hij zei, nou, ik kan over meer dingen praten. Twee hoofdthema's bleven over bijgeloof of toeval. En het werd toeval. Toeval. Peter Boeker. Thank you, Peter, for this nice introduction as far as I understood it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here at this wonderful conference so far. Originally, I planned to talk, to give a talk to you on meaningful coincidences. And I would have baffled you with the many hidden messages that are around us and give testimony to some mighty supernatural forces that surround us. I would have begun uh, with a remarkable anagram of a remarkable person that says, as you can see, that William Shakespeare considered himself um, kind of a psalm. And now the pressing question is, of course, which psalm did he mean? Now the answer is straightforward. It's Psalm 46 of the King James Bible, which appeared when Shakespeare was 46 years old. And if you count the 46th word from the beginning, it will be shake from that very psalm. And if you count uh, the 46th word from the bottom, it is spare. So can this be a coincidence? Now, that's, uh, as I said, that's what I originally planned. But then I thought, rather than, uh, well, just uh, talk about Bible codes and crap science, I switch title, and that's what I really want to talk about, and it will be under this title, immediately clear why the human mind is so easily fascinated by uh, coincidence and why it is so easily drawn in front of uh, numerical coincidence to de develop um, superstitious thought. Specifically, I will uh, illustrate that it is the human brain that makes mere coincidence meaningful and that this uh, process of meaning attribution is not confined to the human brain. It also happens with animal nervous systems down to what we sometimes call primitive unicellular organisms. Now, this path from mere to meaningful, and this will be my last point, uh, is in human cognitive psychology uh, crucial to understand the conceptual similarities between genius and madness. So, let's begin with very low-level perceptual functions, and I have to remind you there is no triangle here. It's just your visual cortex that makes up from coincidental alignments, uh, the illusion, we, we call them illusory contours. And if you just slightly turn around these Pac-Man, uh, your percept will be remarkably untriangular. And the same holds for a motion. There is no movement here. And it's, it's even hard to convince you, even if I separate spatially these two coincidentally on-off blinking dots, you will still have the impression of movement, uh, unless you cover with your hand, you cover one part of the coincidence, and then immediately uh, the motion is gone. This also holds for 
higher level, almost aesthetic perception, uh, well, the Belge uh, painter René Magritte would have labeled that photograph, there is no fish, perhaps, and there is no fish. It's just a pond with reed protruding. Can I show this? Yeah. And uh, even the eye and the bubbles this gasping fish produces is just made up from the coincidental uh, coming together of uh, reed and reflections and so on. Also, in higher order motion perception, there is no causation here, nor is there any uh, social interactions. It's just your brain that constructs all these meaning out of admittedly constructed coincidences. <laughs> now, let's now leave perception behind and move on to seeing the world in a more abstract sense, in interpreting the forces that, that hold our world together, in developing notions of chance and randomness and so on. And I would like to ask you at this point, uh, if you are back home, why don't you ask a person among your acquaintances or friends uh, of whom you know that she or he believes in extrasensory perception, in extrasensory causation of coincidences, why don't you believe him? Uh, why do you believe? And then this person uh, will typically say, you know, that's, that's the wrong question. I do not believe in extrasensory perception. I have experienced it. And then he will recount uh, an episode of which this one is, is very typical. It starts with a dream. You dream about winning a red car. You wake up next morning, uh, learn of a competition, take part, and uh, eventually win a red car. Now, that's amazing. That, that could turn you and me into a believer, okay? especially if it happens night after night. That's, that's like if you commute to work in the morning and all people wear their underwears. We have seen before. So, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, this is a very infrequent event. Well, what is much more frequent is the dream is the same, but next morning your green bicycle gets stolen. You're laughing, but I, knew, uh, I know of more than a handful of people who would swear that this is no coincidence. Uh, they would argue, well, car, bicycle, both vehicles, uh, red and green, what could be more closely related to these opposing colors, and whether you win something in life or you lose it, oh, come on, let, let's not be picky about that. So, what we see from that is that the meaningful, the, the subjective meaningfulness of a coincidence depends on associative processing. Somebody who does not associate uh, will never establish any association between two uh, coincidental events, and we'll also not have to develop any causal theories. I could also formulate that a little bit more poetically in the words of Lessing. For a true believer, the word chance or mere coincidence must simply not exist. Now, in the following minutes, I would like to introduce some of the work we did over the, word of, of, over the years. Uh, to quantify belief in extrasensory perception in meaningful coincidences. And one task, a very easy task, is to imagine rolling a die over and over again and just calling out the numbers from one to six in a random sequence. This is called the mental dice task. What we found is something which is not particularly novel, namely that all subjects, all healthy subjects, avoid naming coincidental events, uh, two after two, or three uh, after three, and so on. <clears throat> but what was novel is that this repetition avoidance or coincidence suppression effect is uh, highly significantly larger for those uh, people who believed in extrasensory perception. We established that uh, by uh, questionnaires. So a uh, similar task is blindfolded subjects have to roll a pictorial die and just naming the events they think uh, show up. The die we used has three pictures. It shows Reed, 
It shows a carrot, and it shows an ambiguous animal. You can either see the duck, it's rather a stork here, but it's a duck facing to the right with the beak here, or you know that famous animal possibly, uh, the rabbit with its ear behind, which looks here. We have only tested uh, subjects who have either seen the rabbit or the duck. Okay? And they had to produce sequences like read, read, duck, carrot, and so on. And obviously, you can see we were interested again in repetitious namings and also in associatively related paths, but, uh, because you can see that the duck is semantically associatively related to read, but not to carrot, and vice versa, the rabbit is related to carrot, but not to read. Okay? What we found is, and again, we tested different subjects believing or being skeptical about extrasensory perception. And what we found is that the believers actually suppressed not only direct repetitions, like in the dice task, but also associative pairings more than uh, disbelievers did, which leads us to conclude that coincidences of any kind, repetitions or similar events, are more salient in the brain of believers, and that's why they uh, are more surprised if a coincidence happens in everyday life, and also this, this, you can capture this effect in labor laboratory tasks. So this is such a strong and robust effect. It shows uh, in, up in many experiments that we have to ask, and it's, it's not dependent on intelligence or education. So what about the biology of this effect? How do animals perform if they have to generate randomness? Of course, uh, uh, we cannot ask them to roll dice or flip coins or so. What we did is, or not what we did, what in the 50s, back in the 50s has been done, is to have animals explore a simple tea maze, and you have to look that there is no preference to one side, so it's 50 to 50, it's an unbiased coin, that brain. Now you force that brain, or the whole animal, to make a left turn on the entrance and just score which side it will choose. And don't think it will decide like a coin. It will, after being forced to one side, go in 80% of the cases, it will switch the side. And this effect is called spontaneous alternation behavior. And it's totally equivalent to repetition suppression in the case of human subjects, or not only subjects, but of the human mind, also showing that gambler's fallacy in, in casinos and so on. So, of course, you can't play around with that. This has been shown, this effect of repetition avoidance, spontaneous alternation behavior across a wide range of species, but you can also play around with the type of maze. You can just prolong the way and also the time between forced and uh, and free choice. And of course, one time you will reach a point where the animal has simply forgotten to which side it turned, and it is exactly then, see, that it turns like a coin. And that's, that's what we learn in mathematics. Coins and dice are ideal uh, randomization devices because exactly because they do not have any memory. Okay. So we, we pushed things even farther and asked, uh, what about uh, human sperm cells? And we tested human sperm cells in tiny, tiny mazes. And uh, lo and behold, we found, oops, sorry, uh, we found a significant spontaneous alternation rate at very short distances, which let us conclude, and that's perhaps the most global and sweeping conclusion, that life is incompatible with randomness. And obviously you can actually quarrel about whether a sperm cell is, is a living organism, it's, it's behaving, but I don't want to go in this detail. It's on its way to become a living organism. Okay, so given that abundance of the effect and that robustness of, of repetition avoidance, spontaneous alternation behavior, we could ask what, what could be 
uh, the driving force from an evolutionary stance? What could be the advantage of projecting meaning to uh, coincidental events or to random patterns? And here you have to imagine for a minute going back in time, not, not that far as we heard in, in uh, a morning talk, not that far uh, when plants and animals separated, but just when man, separate, uh, when man descended from the trees and began life in the savanna, where also the tiger lives and uh, the tiger is striped and tries to camouflage itself from the grassland. Now, not seeing these stripes, not seeing the tiger, would be absolutely detrimental. It would be immediately eaten up and you would be extinct within years. On the other hand, seeing tigers everywhere doesn't, doesn't kill you immediately. I mean, Richard Dawk uh, Dawkins would possibly disagree here, but it's just not that bad, the consequence of elaborating into superstitious um, or religious ideas. But it, it keeps you busy, it keeps you fit if you run away too many times. And the same also holds in a non-evolutionary um, uh, scenario. The question here is, are these lines similar, the axes are in hundreds of kilometers, and you may recognize, and, and nowadays every child knows that it's no coincidence that these are the coastlines, South America, Africa, the continents have been together and separated, shifted apart, and so on. And this was not known uh, when Alfred Wegener actually proposed that theory of continental drift. And it lasted, you won't believe it now, but it lasted more than 50 years that people admitted, and, and scientific people, geologists, that admitted there is something behind that uh, random similarity. And on the other hand, it's no coincidence that we have, that, have seen that uh, face before. This morning, Chloe has shown it. Uh, those who spotted that face on Mars concluded that there are about 11 or a dozen books about the face on Mars. And they conclude, usually uh, from this observation, that there is human-like life on other planets. And uh, you see, I would like to end with uh, this slide and the suggestion that both the ability to survive and to pass on one's gene to the next generation and also scientific creativity, and for that matter, not only scientific creativity, also artistic creativity and conference creativity, depends on a, on a delicate balance between spotting a pattern and, um, well, being cautious enough not to, see, not to see patterns everywhere. Thank you for listening. Did you want to make a commercial? Yeah, yeah. He, he makes a commercial. This is not paid. Um, please buy this button here. It's the logo from next year on for pink. As everybody can see, it's a P in C, P in S. It's pink. It's about 20 euros. Uh, when you buy it from me from cash and next yeah, year yeah, it will yeah. be <laughs> that's the way he went to rich <laughs> no that was sweet where, uh, where can we buy that one uh, no it's not uh, you can't yeah, buy you it cannot I buy brought it, it for you yes. your brother for me ok when it's not a shampoo glad for you Peter then you have to go to the ok 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 I can't speak Swedish but that's what I Trek even de jas bij aan, hoewel dat vandaag niet erg.